organizer here at the SSA. Uh, any of you who follow my work with the SSA, uh, you know that repeatedly I'm having to yell at obstructive high school administrators. One of the key weapons that I have to do battle with obstructive administrations in high school yeah. is the work by Dr. Goodman <laughs> and Dr. John Mueller, who's in the audience. Where's John? Who gave up his seat for someone else, apparently, even though he's part of the content. Um, both of them deserve a round of applause. Their work has been so well done. school and college level. It's in all the SSA's brochures, and it's been wonderful for me to meet Dr. Goodman, and I'm very much looking forward to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much for coming. Everybody, Dr. Kathy Goodman. I am totally surprised by the large turnout of this audience, so thank you so much for coming. Um, and I, I need to preface this with when I planned who I was talking to, I was really thinking that I was talking to advisors of SSA groups. So that's not to say if you're a student, you're not gonna find some interesting things in this conversation, but a little bit, especially up front, it might not be as relevant. So I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, so I teach student affairs in higher education, and student affairs are the, the professionals on campus that work outside of the classroom. So career services, residence life, advising, all of those kind of people, people working with student organizations. And so what I wanted to do is take a um, look at what we can learn from student affairs perspectives and what we can learn about the new research that's coming out on atheists and see if we can get some ideas about how to make campuses more non-religious friendly. So I'm very briefly going to tell you that there are four overarching concepts in student affairs and my professors would be appalled if they knew that I was summarizing, you know, seven years of grad school in a one minute slide, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> And so one of the things that drives us is that we're committed to the whole student. So we recognize students aren't just on campus to learn. It's not just about their brain. They have a body, they have a mind, they have emotions. Some may say they have spirit, the vocation. So we're interested in all of those things. And we're not interested in just the students, but creating an environment where students can grow in all of those areas. And the campus environment means all parts of the campus. So out of classroom, uh, in the classroom, trying to get students involved in educationally purposeful activities. And, and the idea is the more that students are involved in certain kinds of activities, like participating in a group like SSA, the more they'll grow on all these different dimensions. But it's not just like up to students to say, okay, I'm gonna do all this. It's up to us to create an environment that welcomes them and has a structure for them to participate in that. And the idea is that if they do that, they're gonna grow cognitively, so they're gonna think differently, they're gonna um, develop their identity, ability to interact with other people, so develop on those three areas. And part of what student affairs has to do, and part of what advisors, I think, need to do, is provide enough challenge to help people grow in those ways, but simultaneously provide the support that they need. So I'm going to give you a very brief lesson in student development, and I'm going to talk about three different areas. In cognitive development, and I'm summarizing bunches and bunches of psychological theory and condensing it very small, so don't take this all totally literally, it's just a generality, that people go from thinking dualistically, meaning that someone tells you an idea and you believe it, and that's it, because they're an authority and you're not. And so you, there's a right answer to everything if you just find the right person to give it to you. And then that, um, as you start to be exposed to competing opinions, they move through this stage called multiplicity where you recognize there are multiple opinions and you kind of accept them all equally. You don't have the, the capability to say, okay, well this one might be better than this one for these reasons. And so that's where we wanna go next, where you can kind of reason out the differences, reason out why you chose to be an atheist, think about it, defend your choices, and then ultimately commit to that. And that commitment doesn't mean that you can't interact with people that are different than you. It actually allows you to interact with people that are different than you because you're so steadfast in your own beliefs and your way of thinking. Um, I'm gonna skip, I think, the identity development and interpersonal development, but there are th these different stages that people go through as they're growing. And the bottom diagram here kind of summarizes what leads to development process. So there's usually some kind of dissonance, some kind of belief or idea that doesn't fit with what you already believe. 
So uh, someone might come into campus saying, atheists are immoral. You've never experienced that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then they find out, oh, my roommate's an atheist, and he's a good guy. Um, so one of two things can happen. You can assimilate that, meaning, OK, I'm still going to keep my same cognitive structure. I'm still going to think atheists are immoral. My roommate is just the exception to the rule. Or they can accommodate it by, oh, sorry, there's an E missing there, by realizing, oh, atheists have morals even if they don't come from the same place that my morals come from. So it's by exposure to this kind of dissonance that helps people grow. So from a student affairs perspective, when we think about what, we, what advisors should be helping with the student groups, there should be individual support. We should worry about each person and feeling safe in their own personal development. But we should also be worrying about the campus and making sure that the campus is a place that's, um, that we're providing education about atheists so that, that they can feel safe and doing tolerance building. And by that, I do mean more than just, oh, I'll put up with them, but really fair, objective, and permissive attitude toward those whose opinions, practices, race, religion, nationality differ from one's own. Freedom from bigotry. So that was a student affairs perspective. Now there's been some atheist research coming out of sociology mostly in the past few years that talks about identity development of atheists. And so Smith in 2001 did this study of 45 people and found that, of course, in the US, there's an, a ubiquity of theism. It's everywhere, it's the standard, it's the norm. And so anyone who develops as an atheist has to develop out of that perspective, essentially. And the people he talked to talked about questioning theism, and a lot of that came with questioning with moral issues, feeling like, well, Christianity hasn't always been the most moral thing. There's lots of evil things talked about in the Bible. So they start by talking about those kind of things, by making questions about science, and eventually get to rejecting theism. And that comes with a commitment to science and a rejection of supernatural. And it's creating an identity of not me, but not in a bad way. It's the same way as um, someone who is a vegan is not a meat eater. So someone who's an atheist is not a believer in God. So that's not the only thing about them. It's just one piece of how their identity is constructed. And then um, hopefully, and I, I'm assuming if people are members of SSA, SSA, they've got to the point of claiming atheism as part of their identity and feeling validated by social interaction with other atheists. Um, as you may have noticed, it's difficult because there is a lot of stigmatism. But at the same time, there's empowerment and confidence from coming out as an atheist. Fitzgerald also did a study of 35 people, and you'll see very similar patterns. The people she um, interviewed pretty much were, grew up in some kind of religion, and they started to have doubts or questions specifically about that religion which they, were, they grew up in. And then from there, they began to question all religion in general. And then they began to doubt larger, deeper questions of the existence of God. And that she found that this was a slow progress for most of them um, over many, many years. So I'm assuming there's probably some kind of different process going on for people who are like in their late teens and 20s who've already made it to the stage of identifying as atheists. But these people um, all took like 10 to 20 years to get there. Um, and she found that for those people who grew up in families that were highly religious, it took longer for them to come to claiming an atheist identity. And then she tried to figure out what it is that makes people become um, atheists. And what she found was, you know, like you hear people say like, oh, did something traumatic happen to you in your childhood? Or, you know, the devil your babysitter or whatever. <laughs> And the reality is she could not find among her participants any one reason. She found that it was all these reasons working together. So there were things about their environment and things about how they think about the world that kind of reinforced each other and helped them in their process of developing an atheist identity. And then Lou also did a study of 11 people and um, started out with the idea that atheist identity is highly stigmatized in the US. It's not true in all their countries. Um, so people want to have a consistent
consistency between how they see themselves and how others perceive them. So it can be really hard, like I think I'm a good person and I'm meeting someone new and if I tell them an atheist and they think I'm a bad person, that causes some kind of dissonance. And so um, he found that there were three ways to deal with that. So um, they could affirm their identity, which does help increase self-esteem and help redefine the meaning of atheism and acquire social support from other atheists. But simultaneously, it's also causing a bigger rift among people that are not open to that idea. So some people um, chose just to pass. So they avoided the stigma and conflict in order to maintain relationships by not ever telling someone that they were an atheist. To me, from a student affairs perspective, that's not a healthy way to have to live your life. You should be able to own who you are and feel comfortable with that. And then um, what he found was that a lot of people use deceptive disclosure in order to kind of sort of maintain who you are and not cause that rift with other people. And so the example, and a lot of them was with their grandparents actually in this study. <laughs> so they, um, you know, um, you find ways to, to answer questions in a way that's not really a lie, but might be, a, you know, not the whole truth. So, you know, you meet someone, oh, what religion are you? I grew up Catholic. That's absolutely true for me, <laughs> but it doesn't represent who I am now. Um, but he, he found that that kind of deceptive disclosure helped them achieve multiple needs, and so it was common. And then the last theory I want to talk about, um, this is a proposed theory, and it's actually based on a theory of LGBT development. And so what this person is saying is that there's kind of two phases that you go through. There's you as an individual, but you as someone who's part of a group. And it starts by sort of being a, becoming aware that you're different than other people because of your atheist beliefs, um, and becoming aware that uh, there are others with atheist beliefs. Then starting <coughs> to explore that both personally, what it means to you, and what it means to other people that are you're meeting that are atheists. And then deepening your commitment to that, both in the self through your own knowledge, but also by actively participating in it. <coughs> and then ultimately, coming to that internalization and synthesis of it becomes a part of who you are. And it might not be, it definitely isn't all, everything that you are, but it's a part of you and you are a part of an atheist group, whether it's virtually or personally. Um, and ultimately that entails being part of a minority group in the United States. So putting it all together, um, what I wanted to try to do is come up with ideas for um, how do we support atheist students and then how do we um, make change to the campus environment for atheist students. And these are just some ideas that I came up with, but I'd really love to hear other ideas and have some conversation, have you react. Um, so I think one of the things that there has to be is opportunities for in-group only, um, so meaning time when you're just with other atheists and so you can just say whatever's on your mind and feel totally safe but that can't be the only opportunities that you have but that's an important piece of it um, and having a safe space is an important piece of it and then having opportunities to discuss how you've come to your beliefs how the beliefs are similar and different to each other as other atheists and to other believers and how personal values and morals have developed and what informs them. And I think, I don't think I'm kowtowing to society when I say this, but I think that's an important thing for us to be able to articulate, us being atheists, because the number one reason that, that atheists are stigmatized in, stigmatized in the US is because people believe they have no morals. So I think be, the more that we learn about how we developed our morals and the more we can talk about it, and, and be clear and articulate, the better that will be. Um, I think helping students deal with communication skills and learning to navigate, you know, I gave you the example of the deceptive disclosure, and I don't know that that's necessarily a skill that you need, but maybe you do. But it's learning how the way you talk about yourself might differ in different groups. When you're at the SSA conference and you're with all your atheist buddies, 
you want to totally make fun of religion and go crazy, yeah, you're in a safe space, you can do that. When you're out there interacting in society, there might be different ways of approaching and communicating about that. So another aspect is making sure, um, I was surprised, but not surprised really, to see that there are people at this conference who are not comfortable being out as atheists yet, and that's definitely understandable in our society, but I think part of what we need to do is help people start to feel comfortable with that by giving them support, making sure that they know that they have other people on their side. Because I think if you have to always deny a part of who you are, you can never grow as a complete individual. Um, and I think a part of it, a part of it that's really hard is learning to accept others' beliefs. So we might think that the idea that Jesus was born to a virgin is ridiculous. I personally think that's ridiculous. <laughs> On the other hand, people really truly believe that. And at some level, I just have to accept that's how they're gonna believe, but I'm committed to how I believe. So instead, like, there gets to a point where you can't always argue the difference and you just have to accept culturally we're different. We come from different places, we have different beliefs, and that's okay as long as I can be who I am and you can be who you are and we can interact authentically. But um, I'd be interested in hearing other ideas, like what do you think, I know a lot of you in this room are students, what, what do students need on campus to, to deal with the idea that they're living in a, the a theistic environment? I think uh, one thing that would be very helpful that um, has been a little bit lacking uh, where I'm from is faculty support. So a lot of the religious groups have chaplains or adults in the community who will come and lend support and lend that sort of credibility. And without adult figures to look up to, it can be I think, challenging for students to yeah. feel comfortable and secure. Yeah. And I do think that that's an important part of it. The other half of what I was going to talk about is putting it together, like how do we create the environment that's more open and, and welcoming to these students. And I think just having the student organization is part of it. I think there's sometimes some pushback that has to happen with administration who, who are saying, you know, oh, there's no room for you here. And that's where advisors can be really helpful in helping you figure out how to navigate that kind of thing. Um, I think the more that, that faculty members and or student affairs professionals can integrate ideas of atheism in what they're teaching, in the programs they're developing, that can help go a long way to making it seem just more like, oh yeah, it's normal, it's part of life. Um, I think, and I know there's mixed perspectives on this, but I think um, engagement in interfaith activities and including atheists in that can really help create a campus that's more non-religious friendly. And I think there's um, ideas that can be adapted from the LGBT and racial diversity organizations and offices. So things like safe zone training, campus climate assessment, diversity dialogue. I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna, if you wanna contribute more ideas to what students need and what the campus needs. But first I wanted to share with you, um, John and I will be continuing to do research on atheist students. So. Um, for those of you that are still going to be in college, hopefully you'll be hearing from us through the SSA. And we're actually going to have several phases to this research study. And the first is just to look at some existing national data on college students to see how atheist students compare to non-atheist students, mostly in terms of how it's been talked about as spirituality, which is not a term I really think will relate, but I want to check that out. But then we want to look at um, more theist unspoken attitudes toward atheists. So getting at what kind of bias does exist on campus. And then looking at characteristics and self-definitions of atheist college students. And then more looking at the campus climate. So it's kind of going back and forth between the personal and the environment. And um, ultimately looking at how do atheists and college students find purpose and meaning in their lives so that we can start to talk about it differently on campus instead of it always having to be about religion or spirituality. Um, but what we'd really love to know from you is what are the kinds of things you would want to tell researchers that you would want to be out there in the, in, for other people to be able to read and know about you 
that could help make things better. Yeah. The amount of time we spent researching to become an atheist. <laughs> I think that's underestimated a lot. It's okay. Like you just made a split decision one day. Oh, I'm going to go that. Kathy, can you repeat the same thing? Oh, um, her, she said that one of the things is the amount of time it took to become an atheist and the amount of research that went into it, that it wasn't just like, oh, waking up and, oh, I'm an atheist now. <laughs> yeah. I think there should be a lot of special consideration for students who have grown up in a non-religious environment. Um, my family is, for the most part, non-religious, and I feel like I've had a much easier time adjusting it to a theistic world than people who have had this sort of hardship and transition. Yeah, so that's a good point, growing up in, an, in a non-theist environment. And I think that by researching college students, we're going to find some very different patterns and trends than some of that research that I've cited to you, because you're obviously people who have come to this decision at a much younger age, and there are things that helped you get there, and that's part of what I'd like to know. Okay, we have two minutes, so yes, and then there was someone in the back who had their hand up, so I think you're next. A I think there should be an examination on like the self-defeating and apathetic attitudes that some atheists have, like particularly like ones on certain online communities that are like, why should we do anything outside of here in the space? I would never have thought about that. Okay, so self-defeating attitudes. Yes. And also from a, uh, I'm a resident assistant, and um, I think that it's extremely important. This is a bit more relevant to something previous, but I think it's extremely important to make sure in college administration residents' lives, that resident assistants are understanding of some of the difficulties that atheist students can go through, yeah. um, and especially with the process of, of deconverting, um, that can be very difficult for some students. Right, so making sure uh, the, pe the faculty and, and staff are trained, yes? Uh, our group went through a firebrand phase, as I'm sure a lot of other groups have. Well, how does that how does that evolution of firebrand versus diplomat uh, affect uh, campus groups' perception? And how can a, a bad event that maybe antagonizes the campus how can their uh, image recover? And how long does that take? Right. Okay, that's a good good question. I'm having a feeling that I have to wrap up, but what I quick answer, quick answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't have an answer to it. I was just at it saying that would be good ah, to incorporate cool. into the research. <laughs> um, but what we have here is a little flyer that tells you a little bit about what John and I have already done as far as research, but it has a little um, a URL so you can go on there and say, these are the kinds of things that I would like to see you ask in your research. So if you're interested in how more ideas we didn't get to share here, I'd love to have it. Guys, for most of us, we got into this whole thing because it's hard being an atheist in public. That's going to change in the next few years, and it's the work of these people that's really going to drive it. So thank you very much. For